Hi, would you like to find out the latest happenings in Albany? Well, State Senator George Borello is here with us today. He'll be talking about that, plus interesting things about the state of small business, especially in the greater western New York area, as well as what's happening with redistricting. It's all here on the State of Western New York, Greater Western New York Report, brought to you by... Imagine yourself communicating with a difference. Pandimensional Solutions helps you do this. Whether live spectator events, taped broadcasts, or real-time audience-engaging programs, you can benefit immediately from the tools Pandimensional Solutions will share with you. Do you want to make a difference? Contact us at pandimensional.com. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa. Hey, hey, welcome everybody again to this week's version of the State of Greater Western New York Report. I'm Chris Carosa, your favorite host for this episode and all others. Today we've got a very special guest. We've got State Senator George Borello. George Borello represents the, what is it, the 57th District, I believe. And that's roughly the southern, uh, the southern counties along the Greater Western New York region. And George, tell us a little bit about... Uh, how did you actually get into this game of politics? I mean, people are always fascinating with the origin story of our elected officials. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, first of all, Chris, thanks. It's great to be on the show with you today. Um, you know, I, uh, uh, I'm a business person really at heart. I started my own company uh, when I was in my early 20s. I grew that company, uh, ended up uh, selling it uh, to another uh, entity and working really from my, you know, my from 23 until 50 uh, in the private sector. Uh, I was interested in politics. I was uh, actively involved uh, in, in my high school days, actually. Uh, I grew up in the Reagan era. I consider myself a Reagan Republican. And, uh, and then uh, when I got to be into my uh, early 40s, uh, I was uh, asked to run for the county legislature in Chautauqua County. Uh, and I took it as a, an obligation to be a, a citizen legislator, if you will, someone whose feet are firmly planted in the private sector, uh, but will, will also be uh, you know, able to represent the, the region uh, in, my, in my district at the time. Uh, so I, this is what got me into politics. And then um, you know, I got to the point where uh, I, I felt that in my career, I, I could take the leap uh, and to serve the people full time. And in 2017, I ran for county executive in Chautauqua County. Um, happily, I won and um, was able to uh, uh, spend a, a relatively short period of time, only two years, uh, until um, Kathy Young, our previous senator, uh, decided to retire. And we had a special election and uh, I was I guess heavily recruited, I'll say, by uh, uh, several folks to run for that seat, and uh, did run, and again uh, won. Very grateful, uh, and very just very grateful and humble to serve the people of Western New York and the Southern Tier, uh, into uh, actually up into the Finger Lakes as one of the largest geographically one of the largest state senate districts that spans 4,039 square miles uh, from uh, the beautiful shores of Lake Erie where I live uh, all the way uh, to Chautauqua Lake the many other great lakes and waterways and up into the Finger Lakes uh, in Livingston County so uh, um, I'm again proud to serve and uh, and I love the fact that uh, the people of western New York are, are amazingly supportive. Well you certainly cover a very large territory and we'll get to that in a second but first give us some sense of what's going on in albany right now i know you just came from a session uh but if it's secret you don't have to tell us uh but let us know what you know what what's going on give us a sense for some of the the current legislation that has been passed maybe some of the things you're talking about and especially what kind of impact it might have on our region well, you know, this session has seen a lot of uh, controversial things happen. And, and uh, my focus has always been how do we ensure that we can support particularly our small businesses, all the families that those small businesses support, supporting agriculture, which is the number one industry in New York State, uh, and uh, as well as 
um, the impacts of some of these uh, uh, challenges that we face. Broadband is a huge issue uh, in rural uh, western New York, especially across the state, really. And uh, that was exacerbated pandemic about how bad that coverage really is. Uh, so, you know, for me, this is about representing not only the people of uh, my of my district, but the people across, you know, upstate New York in particular, that are often left out of the equation uh, in some of these uh, these laws. And and I think what you've seen this year uh, in this uh, in this session is the advancement of, of things that were unfortunately poorly drafted, like our marijuana law and some of the other laws. Uh, that we have seen come across bail reform uh, that are having a huge negative impact on New York State. And people are sadly voting with their feet. They're leaving New York State in record numbers. Um, and uh, to me, that is uh, the number one overarching goal is how do we stop this from happening? Well, we have to start first uh, by addressing the fact that we have a fundamental issue uh, with a lack of due diligence and a lack of stakeholder input in uh, major legislation uh, like the the, the uh, passage of recreational marijuana and others. And if we don't address that, if we don't uh, have an inclusive, open, and transparent government that's accountable to the people, we will continue to lose population. I love the state. I want to stay here. I want everyone else to want to stay here, and I want our children uh, to stay here and raise their families. Uh, and that, to me, is, is the number one goal. Tell us a little bit more about this marijuana law. We've interviewed... Uh lots of mayors and supervisors down local officials and i know your experience is is really as a local official too and they're a little uh perhaps the the rules and the the way it's going to happen is is less clear and it's it's almost like they're they feel and at least the mayors and supervisors that i'm speaking with they feel like they're almost being coerced into making a decision that isn't necessarily in the best interests of their community but the state isn't really giving them a lot of options otherwise. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, look, I've been vocally opposed to the recreational marijuana legalization, but I've also tried very hard to make this legislation better. Um, one of the uh, issues, and, and I think first and foremost, is the fact that um, uh, we have set a very high standard in New York State for how we handle um, people driving under the influence of alcohol. You know, it took a long, painful journey, 30, 40 years to get where we are now, where, you know, even though we still have tragedies, for the most part, our roads are safe, are safe, and that's because of strong enforcement and strong laws. Um, this is not the case with the, the bill that was just passed for recreational marijuana. And I'll give you an example. If you get pulled over by a police officer, and he smells alcohol in your breath. We all know what's going to happen next. You're going to get pulled out of your car, roadside sobriety test. If you are uh, you know, found to be drunk, you're a breathalyzer. You're going to go to the police station. You're going to be booked. You're going to have to pay thousands and thousands of dollars. You may lose your license. You're probably going to lose your license. All these things are effective deterrents that have brought about a much safer <clears throat> roadway uh, in, in New York State and across the nation, really. Now, with the marijuana law that just passed, that same scenario. You get pulled over, the police officer smells marijuana on your breath, he can't do anything. This law specifically states that no action can be taken by law enforcement unless there is an accident with injury. And the difference between how we handle alcohol and how we are going to handle, handle marijuana from a public safety standpoint, that delta, that difference is going to be measured, unfortunately, in deaths and injuries. And that's where we have a major issue, and I have a major issue. There's also issues with the fact that we are completely unprepared for this from a standpoint of having uh, drug recognition experts. Every single police officer in New York State goes out with the tools and the training every day to identify somebody operating a vehicle under the influence of alcohol. Not so for marijuana. There is no breathalyzer, uh, and there's nothing really that's effective on, uh, on the horizon. Therefore, I call for every single one of the police officers in New York State, more than 55,000 of them, to be certified drug recognition experts, just like they are experts at detecting someone under the influence of alcohol. The cost of that initially is going to be $600 million, and the, this budget only allocated less than $20 million. Not anywhere close enough. Uh, on top of that, um, you know, we are going to be facing all of the other um, <clears throat> social health issues in, involved with marijuana, the, uh, the addiction issues, the, the child welfare issues, everything else, and there has been no money allocated for those things. So this is why uh, this law is dangerous. It's dangerous to our public health and safety. And it was drafted instead of with the, in the inclusion of stakeholders like law enforcement, people who are involved in addiction services, local governments. It was drafted with 
radical special interests in mind. And that's all. And uh, that's why it was this ridiculous contest to make uh, New York State the most progressive. And instead of learning from the mistakes that were made in the states that did this before us, we decided we had to we have to go further, go past what they have done, which has put us in uncharted territories as far as what the real impact of this is going to be. Thank you. I could also add that the mayors and supervisors that I speak to, one of the concerns they have is that they, they could essentially opt out of the legislation, which they're allowed to do by the end of the year, but that doesn't change the use issue within their own jurisdiction. And that brings together some, some questions about law enforcement. And how do you do it if you cross, you know, jurisdictional lines? Just a lot of questions that that we have at this level, at, at the at the closest level of government, closest to the people. So so that's that's an issue that's coming up. Uh, there, let, let's switch topics for a second here. Let, let's talk about agriculture because you you do represent an area of the Greater Western New York region that is really got a lot of ag agricultural industry in it. Tell us a little bit about that. And how sensitive is the state how sensitive you know say are the are the representatives from new york city who live in concrete canyons uh, or even maybe like albany who, who don't have as much farmland around them how sensitive are they to the agricultural mm -hmm. interests within our region well i can tell you by the laws that were passed previously that uh, they don't truly understand how important agriculture is um, but i will say this and i have to give uh, folks credit people like uh, Catalina Cruz from Queens who I've worked closely with to expand uh, the Nourish New York program and we were successful in that and and, uh, and one of the um, I guess one of the side effects if you will a positive side effect if, of the pandemic was we learned how fragile our food supply chain was in New York State and how agriculture was critically important to every single person in New York State and that was uh, you know certainly demonstrated by the fact that when um, the food supply chain was interrupted that you had food banks in the most urban parts of New York City like Queens where Catalina Cruz represents that uh, couldn't get food for the for the thousands of families they served each and every week at the same time we had farmers that were dumping milk leaving crops in the fields to rot and it made us realize that um, this is something that had to be addressed. And the Nourish New York program, which I, I, I give the governor credit, and certainly uh, Commissioner Ball from Ag and Markets, who, who made that program uh, work uh, quickly, was a great impact. The problem was <clears throat> it, wasn't, it didn't go far enough, and it wasn't uh, a recurring program that everyone could count on. Our farmers, who, who were really, it was a life-saving uh, uh, income for them, and the food banks, and everyone else that benefited from, uh, from, from having this Nourish New York program, the families uh, that had food insecurity issues. Uh, so now we have the realization of that. And along with that has come a better appreciation uh, from all, all the legislators on both sides of the aisle as to how important New York agriculture really is, how important it is that we have locally um, sourced, locally grown food that's safe, uh, that is uh, and, and available. And that's really the, 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 uh, the, the positive side effect we've seen. Excellent, excellent. We have a couple of minutes before our first break. And I just want to know, not just me, but I guess a lot of people do. And, and by the way, if you're watching right now, we do have a couple of uh, listeners right now on the show live. If you're watching live, you're allowed to ask questions. Just put it in the chat room and I'll read the questions to the senator as they pop up. Uh, but before we go to the break, very quickly, what's the status of Governor Cuomo's emergency powers? Are, do they sunset at any point or are we are we in this uh, this this world forever? Well, you know, there was probably no, no more example of Orwellian speak uh, than the, the, when the, uh, the leadership in Albany said that they were repealing the governor's uh, executive authority, when in fact what they were doing was solidifying it indefinitely. Had they done nothing back in March, his powers would have sunsetted April 30th. Instead, uh, they gave him the ability to uh, decide, determine for himself when this emergency authority will expire. And that is very troubling. Uh, it's very troubling. It should be very troubling for every New Yorker. I don't care what your party affiliation is or if you have no party affiliation. Uh, we're looking at the the uh, the fact that this governor's lost credibility. Uh, the, he's just mired in scandal right now, and he's using this executive authority as a political weapon. Uh, you're seeing this um, consistently. He's he's punishing certain groups and rewarding others uh, that support him uh, or, or defy him. And this needs to end. We need to have this legislature 
reassert itself as a separate co-equal branch of government. And that, unfortunately, was a huge failure, and which is why I voted against the so-called repeal of his powers, uh, was because I knew that day that it was a farce, it was a lie, and we are now seeing daily examples of why uh, we, those who voted against us were, were correct. Well, that's certainly interesting. Well, thanks. Let's, uh, let's take a break here. When we come back, we're going to be talking about the state of small business in greater western New York and a little bit about redistricting. We'll see you in a moment. Through the mists of time, nature and man have both created and buried treasures beyond the imagination. With the ages, these riches slowly dissolve into mere myths until they are forever forgotten. But there are those brave souls who tirelessly cling to the truth, ever seeking to discover the undiscovered, to reveal what has always been there, to uncover the hidden gems of a land thought forsaken, but loved by millions. Fifty Hidden Gems of Greater Western New York. Discover the secrets in your own backyard. Buy your copy now at 50hiddengems.com. Welcome back here. I'm Chris Carosa, and with me is Senator George Borello, who represents the 57th Senate District of the, the state of New York in the Greater Western New York region. Senator Varela, let's talk a little bit now about the state of business in particularly in the greater West New York region. I know that, you know, you started off as a businessman and, you know, you've certainly talked to a lot of people who are in there. You, you've got this ex hands on experience that's really critical to understanding the impact of any legislation on the people who provide the jobs and and really the, the oil that continues the machine that we call greater Western New York. Tell us a little bit about the state of business from your perspective. Well, certainly it's always been challenging to do business in New York State. And let me also tell you that I am still a business owner uh, here in, in western New York. Uh, my wife and I own and she operates uh, several businesses along the Lake Erie shoreline. We're in the hospitality business, the restaurant business. In fact, right behind me is a picture of Sunset Bay Beach where we are in uh, in Western New York, many people I'm sure are familiar with it. It's consistently been voted Western New York's best beach. So my point is, is that the hospitality industry and many others have been difficult. It's been difficult to do business here from day one, quite frankly. And now after the pandemic and part of the pandemic, it has made it even more devastating. Uh, so the state of small businesses, it's strained. And unfortunately, we've done little to nothing in New York State to make it better, uh, and uh, New York State government, and, uh, and in fact, uh, taken a lot of actions that are going to make it far worse. Um, you know, case in point uh, that we have these um, ridiculous, uh, arbitrary executive orders that have punished uh, industries. Uh, for for really no scientific reasons, things like the curfews and having to order um, you know uh, food with alcohol and and everything else that has uh, you know been inconsistent uh, and it has hurt businesses. Uh, about twenty percent of New York restaurants, just as an example, have closed. Most of which will never reopen. Uh, and we have uh, we've made it more difficult now in this post pandemic for people to be able to hire people. Uh, with extending unemployment benefits uh, to where people, 70% of, of people in the United States at one point were making more in unemployment than they were when they were working. Uh, and uh, you add to that the fact that all this unemployment ended up cratering our unemployment insurance fund, which is funded by largely small businesses in New York State. Uh, and uh, folks that, some of which never so laid off a single employee, are opening up their unemployment insurance bills and seeing their rates double and triple myself included. Uh, these are, this is making putting a tremendous strain on, on all business, but especially our small businesses, which are the backbone of our economy. Um, the Buffalo Niagara Partnership uh, did a survey recently, uh, and it's very troubling to see. 80% um, of, uh, of the uh, 
businesses that, that they interviewed said that conditions are worse here in New York State than they were a year ago. Now, keep in mind, a year ago, we were in the middle of the pandemic, and it's worse now uh, than it is than it was then. Um, about 50% expect things to get worse uh, than they are now in 2021. And this is the most troubling. Half of the businesses that the Buffalo Niagara Partnership in, uh, interviewed said that if they could, they would leave New York State. So this is a crisis created by government and created by the, the legislators that are really out of touch uh, for what, as, you kept, as you've said, the oil uh, that keeps this machine running, uh, which is our small businesses. You know, I was just talking with a small business owner, and, and every once in a while we'll have interviews with people on this show who own businesses or, or people who serve businesses. And I was talking to a, several, actually, small business owners, and they repeatedly tell me about how difficult it is to hire people right now. In fact, one person said that, the, that, they would, they would, that, that a prospective employee would actually accept less money if it was paid under the table so they could continue to get their federal government benefits. Well, let's talk not so much about that because that is partially a state issue, yes. Let's talk about something that really is a state issue, and that's the minimum wage law. And I know that it was really pushed by the downstate region for probably pretty good reasons, but to have it universally applied throughout the state, I think that we've seen some of the harm of that. We've seen some franchise owners, and you know this in the hospitality industry, some franchise owners basically shut down some of their franchises because they, they didn't want to be impacted by this law. But, but now we have even governments, county governments, raising their minimum to $15 an hour. How is that going to impact private businesses? And, and what might you suggest a better way to approach this is? Well, first of all, uh, I think there's been no topic more politicized than the minimum wage. Uh, there is this uh, rhetoric that, um, you know, it needs to be a living wage and people need to be able to raise a family on it. But the facts are, are, are that the vast, vast majority, better than 90 percent of people that are making minimum wage are largely young people working in uh, either part time or seasonal or, or opening, you know, uh, starting positions. Uh, they're not raising a family on it. And what this has done is, is that um, it has basically created a situation where businesses are going to uh, more quickly automate. And you see that especially uh, in things like the fast food industry and the hospitality industry in general, which means less young people will be employed. I can tell you at our businesses, um, which you know, we, have, we have seasonal employees, most of which are high school and college age, um, you know, we have to unfortunately try and find ways to cut labor. And, you know, we're in a rural um, community with a high amount of poverty. These are kids that come from, you know, middle class and, and poor families that need to have jobs. And we will certainly do everything we can to keep those kids employees, employed. But myself, I'm, we're not unique in this. This is the case for a, a lot of businesses that just simply cannot afford uh, to keep people on staff. And uh, the minimum wage, number one, should be regionalized. Number two, it, it should also be based on uh, you know, the fact that it's, it's a supply and demand thing. Where you have to pay more, you will pay more. And, and that's just a basic economic principle. And here, where we are in, in, uh, in western New York, particularly in my district, which you know, shares a, 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 a very large border with the state of Pennsylvania, you can literally stand with one foot in New York State and the other foot in Pennsylvania to have to compete with the fact that their minimum wage is half of what ours is. Um, is just a, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a situation that is just un, you know, untenable in most cases for our small businesses especially. Let's talk a little bit about redistricting because that's going to be coming up with the new census and everything. Actually, let's start with the census. I know there was some controversy with regards to how the people were counted in New York State. The governor is complaining that we were undercounting other people across the station or states. Uh, in the United States are saying we were overcounted. What have you heard just about that, just about the census itself? Well, you know, what I can say is we didn't hear much about the census. And I, and, uh, <clears throat> I, I, don't, I think the state um, did a poor job, uh, to be honest with you. Um, so from that standpoint, I think that um, we could have done better. Um, but there's a greater issue here. You know, the, the, the fact that we have to rely on uh, 89 people, whatever the number is, 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 is a testament to the fact that we've lost population. Uh, other states gained, you know, and again, they'll say, well, we are a population increase, but nowhere near uh, the rate at which um, other states around us and, and just states in general had. We were near the bottom when it came to that. So the reality is we should not have had to been 
scraping the bottom of the barrel, if you will, from a census standpoint. Instead, we should have changed the narrative in New York, changed the laws in New York, and made this a place that people wanted to stay in and didn't want to leave. You know, I saw a statistic of uh, how many people exchanged their New York State driver's licenses for Florida driver's licenses in the past year, and it was something like 35,000 people, and that was a 32% increase from the year before. So that just tells you, again, that um, this is about people voting with their feet. And uh, we can sit here and, and try and nitpick about things like the, the count in the census, but the reality is we should have never been in that position to begin with. We have a question that just came in. It was, how do you feel about Assemblyman David DiPietro's proposal to create an autonomous zone, he says, for greater way to Western New York, but I think DiPietro's proposal is actually a larger footprint than mm -hmm. that. But even either way, uh, what do you think about this idea of uh, autonomous zones? Um, actually, I, I co-sponsored a bill in the Senate um, that uh, would split us into three autonomous regions. Um, essentially Long Island, the five boroughs of, of, of New York City, and then upstate New York. We would still be one state. I think it's a heavy lift uh, to, to think that we're going to be able to actually split New York State into two, two separate states. It literally takes an act of Congress. Uh, but if we can create three autonomous regions, uh, I, I, I'm in favor of that. And, and you know, there are folks out there that will say we can't survive without New York City. Uh, you know, and the income that, that it provides. But, uh, you know, the reality is um, we would operate government very differently than they do in New York City and uh, much more cost effectively, which would likely uh, bring more business to upstate New York, which would create more revenue. Did you see the news? I think it was yesterday that uh, several counties in, what was it, uh, Oregon, I think, voted to move over to Idaho. I don't know what it takes to make that real, but uh, there is yeah. there is this sort of thing that, you know, with different sections of different states are getting fed up with being pushed around by the population centers is really what it gets down to. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, let's I mean, this kind of goes into redistricting and, and what kind of impact we might see that having on us, even even within the Senate. I know I've talked to some assemblymen who explained how things are a little tilted towards New York City where they get to represent a smaller number of people while people in, well, assemblymen in Western New York have to represent a little bit more, all within the range, the legal range. It's just that things are tilted a little bit. Do you see the same thing in the Senate? And go ahead and ask that, but then I have an immediate uh, follow-up to that. It's, yeah, the answer is yes. Um, and uh, it was more, um, I guess it was more pronounced in the assembly uh, when Sheldon Silver was in place last time around and he was able to essentially, uh, you know, make the uh, rural Republican districts on the high end of the populations and the, uh, the, the urban ones on the low end. And that resulted in moving more, shifting more seats toward New York City. Um, and that did happen in, in, in the Senate, but because of the, you know, the lower, less number of seats, the less pronounced it was. Now, let me ask more of a historical question, and that is New York State's Assembly and Senate sounds like it's similar to the federal government's Congress and Senate, but it's not in the sense where the Senate at the federal level, you know, represents all states equally. But here within New York State, the Senate is just nothing more than a population based representative form of uh, legislature. Why Why haven't we ever gone with the idea of maybe having each county getting a couple senators so we're kind of similar to what the federal government is doing? And, and wouldn't that sort of mitigate some of the issues that we have of, of really not being able to be represented? Not that you're not doing a good job representing mm -hmm. the greater Western New York region, but there's not enough of you, <laughs> there's, to, you know, to compete about what's going on elsewhere. Well, first of all, um, you know, your, the answer to your question is, is New York City would never allow, a, you know, the, the Senate to, to be able to be equally represented for all counties. Um, that's really what it comes down to. But we, there is a there was a bill and I and I'm supportive of it uh, that Senator Joe Griffo had, had introduced um, uh, actually prior to me being in the Senate uh, that would call for exactly that. It would reduce the number of senators from 63 to 62, which is the number of counties that we have in New York State, and give each county its own senator. Um, but obviously the, 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 uh, the Senate uh, leadership, which is dominated by Democrats, uh, and, the, and the leadership of the legislature and, and the governor's office, I should say, not just the Senate, uh, would, you know, wouldn't even bring this up for a discussion because they know that um, 
you know, this would make the uh, Republicans uh, probably a permanent supermajority uh, in the Senate because of the fact that you look at uh, the last gubernatorial election, the governor won in a landslide, but he did so with only winning, I think, seven counties out of the entire state. Uh, so what does that tell you? That tells you that we have a, uh, you know, uh, a very lopsided representation. And, and I agree. I think that um, you know, this is why you have two houses, because there's, there are some states that only have one house. They don't have uh, a bicameral uh, representation. So if you do, you should, it, should be equal rep it should be a balanced way to represent, and that's not the case in New York State. Well, thank you, Senator. Do you have any closing moment uh, thoughts? We're, we're about ready to wrap up here. Uh, but uh, if, if you are interested, folks, if you are interested in being part of this live audience where you can ask questions, I encourage you to go to our website, stateof.greaterwesternnewyork.com, and just register with that site. You'll be put on the exclusive email invitation where you will get invitations each Thursday before the show so you can log on to our private room and be able to ask our guests questions. So, Senator, thank you very much for participating in today's show. And everybody else, thank you for watching us, whether it's live now or in the archive or on our YouTube and Facebook channels. We're here each week. We'll see you later. Welcome, everyone, to this edition of the State of Greater Western New York Report. Join us each episode as we discuss fantastic topics ranging from history to science to the strange and the wonderful, as well as the treasured spirit with which our region has infused America. We challenge you to consider all things Greater Western New York, from our region's very beginnings to how it inspires, how it empowers, and why it is so admired. Here's the host of the State of Greater Western New York Report, Chris Carosa.